The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. The Dave Hooker Show. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. Objective insight, expertise, top guest. Available on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the Off the Hook Sports app. Download now for free. Also available on offthehooksports.com. I compute and obey. Now to Dave Hooker. Ready. Boy, there are plenty of things to talk about. Don't tell me that there's not. Welcome to the program as... With Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. We'll dive right into it as Tennessee looking for a new coach on the women's basketball side. And as we all know, that's a bigger deal at Tennessee than it is for the lion's share of the other schools. We all know what that means. So I encourage you to hit that like button, hit subscribe. If you haven't done so to this point, we would greatly appreciate it. Also coming up on the program, the latest from Tennessee's football practice as the ball's pretty happy with one freshman receiver whose name just continues to crop up. So we'll get to that. Also some Tennessee basketball news. Freddie DeLeon is Freddie Cianara. He is uh, gone, entered the transfer portal. Little surprised, not incredibly surprised. Also we'll discuss would the balls have been in the final four if they didn't lose uh, DJ Burns. So we'll get to that, but it's first time for today's tough question. But I got to ask, how are you, Caleb Calhoun? How are you doing, sir? I am good, Dave, and I really did not need that comment from uh, Smoky Mountain Red because it's just a reminder that I have to do my taxes this weekend, and I'm really not looking forward to that. Did he already take a shot at you? So what happened? What was the shot? I didn't see it on the message board. Smoke no, he just said, he just said, all he's done this week is give the IRS money. And I'm like, yeah, it's tax week. Oh, Ooh, and this is brutal. 30 years ago today, Kurt Cobain passed away. Oh, man, that's rough. 30 yeah. years. That's crazy. I mean, is that that's bizarre. I mean, for me, that was that that was my jam. You know, the transition from the hair bands just to the grunge deconstruction of rock which is going to happen one day to your taylor swift girl but well she wouldn't deconstruct anything she's a pop star now i know but she but all this pop stuff's going to get deconstructed soon there's going to be a somebody that just comes out and rocks just for the sake of rocking and they don't need all the the flashing lights and that's what nirvana was but anyway today's tough question is now boom today's tough question Take a side. Take a stand. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of OffTheHookSports.com. There seems to be two names that are creeping to the top of the Lady Ball list. Now, this is a little bit of a wish list and a little bit of a what we're hearing list because I'm going to go ahead and tell you that Danny White is as good as there is in the business of keeping things close to the vest. So let's start with the two names that are getting the most play. And this is what I'm hearing. And this is also, I think, a little bit of speculation in terms of a couple of coaches that would be big time wins. And it's brought to you by Boundless Moving from the two hour minimum to turnkey operations. They have you covered. They have you covered. Boundless Moving is Tennessee and in Charlotte. Boundless Moving. Google them. Tell them off the hook sports sent you. So what are the two names we're primarily hearing right now to replace Kelly Harper as a Lady Vol head coach uh, for the women's basketball team? Yeah, so the two prominent names are Becky Hammond and Lindsey Gottlieb. For those who don't know, Lindsey Gottlieb is the USC coach. She's had a lot of success there. She has gone to the Final Four with Cal, which is pretty impressive. And so Lindsay Gottlieb is a has a great, great, great track record. Um, she Becky Hammond has been involved is the first female NBA assistant, I believe. She is now the head coach of the WNBA team, the Las Vegas Aces. Um, 
So she has a lot of connections too. Becky Hammond has never coached at the college level though. She's always been in the pros as a WNBA assistant, an NBA assistant, an overseas assistant or overseas head coach, um, something like that. Um, excuse me, overseas player. So she was a Spurs assistant from 2014 to 2022. And she is now the Las Vegas Aces head coach. So here's the mindset by some people. Go throw whatever money you need to at her so that you can get yourself a coach with professional experience and somebody that's going to be just a home run, no question about it. I've got a big question about it. And I have the same question because this reminds me of John Gruden. There was no guarantee that John Gruden was going to be just an incredible recruiter and work tireless hours and an an unbelievable college head coach, even though he had had success at the NFL level. So I think this is the same thing. I don't think there's any guarantee Becky Hammond would have success because she feels like a pro coach to me. And I'll add on to that. I think it's a long shot unless she just grew up loving Pat Summit. Why would she come to Tennessee? Caleb, this to me sounds like a fairy tale top of hire. Yes, this is getting wide-eyed over pro success, which <laughs> makes no sense. And also, not just pro success, but I mean, we could talk like qualifications here. I mean, you're just looking at the name because she coached under Greg Popovich for a while. Now she has won, to her credit. She's won back-to-back WNBA championships, two years coaching in Vegas, two championships. That's pretty impressive. However, I mean, guys. I'm going to throw a name out there for you, Dave, a name that you might be familiar with. It's a guy by the name of Bill Walsh. Remember when Stanford took a chance on Bill Walsh because of his NFL success a uh, yes. long time ago? Yes. How, how'd that work out? Well, he's pretty much pushed out the door, and what he brought, that West Coast timing offense, was so commonplace. It's, it's almost like um, offenses nowadays with the RPO. I mean, they're – they're new in the beginning, like what Chip Kelly did was new in the beginning, but now it's just, uh, you know, you get ready for that for everything else. So no, it, it didn't, didn't work out well. Um, but the, the Becky Hammond thing to me is, is fun again to talk about, but here's the other thing. Let's say Tennessee got Becky Hammond to be the head coach of, of the lady balls. And she is accomplished. She has won professional championships, which, again, is a different, not better, not worse. But, Caleb, it's a different job, right? Coaching in the program. Totally different job. Totally different. Not better, worse. Just way, way, way different. And especially nowadays, even more so. To think that she's just going to step in and be great at college is is a huge reach to me in and of itself. I don't know that she's going to be great at at college and here's the other thing do you think for one second she is whose protege greg popovich at the san at san antonio spurs yes greg popovich okay. so what's going to happen in two years when greg popovich wins one more title with victor wampamiyama and he they get the call that he's done and they call her and they say would you like to take over and be the head coach of one of the most transcendental transcendental coaches or players in the history of the game, you're going to say yes. So you're going to lose her in a short amount of time. Cause I think Popovich is what 78, 80. Is he that yeah. Old? That's, I think that's Popovich's goal. That was always his goal was to get her to be his next in line. He wanted to make sure he built the Spurs up to where the, she could win with, because what pop wants right. is he wants her to be the first women coach in the NBA. And then her to have a ton of success in the NBA because she's coaching Victor Wambanyana. And so then the narrative 50 years from now is the first women's head coach in the NBA won five NBA titles. You know what I mean? Or something like that. That's what they're trying to do here. She might have already been the head coach of the Spurs had they not won the lottery. Because I don't know that Popovich would have come back if he didn't have one Pungama. I think that re-excited his career. Now, now we do have a, a breakdown for Josh Ward. Five things you need to know about Lisa Gottlieb. Because I Lindsay, think... Uh, Lindsay. Lindsay. Excuse me. Lindsay Gottlieb. Because I don't want to put words in your mouth, Caleb, but this seems like if you if you want to talk about a big time hire, this is a big time hire that is a lot more approachable than Hammond. So just to, for those that don't know, and then we'll do the five things Josh said to know about Lindsey Gottlieb, and it's on offthehooksports.com right now. What are your impressions of her from afar? To me, it's kind of like if you look at the realistic candidates and take out the Mulkies, 
take out the Genos, you know, just going and getting the Don Staley's. This one seems to me like the most approachable candidate that would be a bang, bang, awesome hire. You? I love this hire. Now, yeah, let me address true. some. Let me address something people are trying to say. There's this idea that Lindsay Gottlieb is a California person, so she'd want to stay out there because she was at Cal from 05 to 08, then at UC Santa Barbara, then back to Cal, and then at USC. But she spent two years in the NBA, too, as an assistant for the Cavs from 2019 mm -hmm. to 2021. And by the way, she helped develop that Cavs team into a playoff team in the post-LeBron era, which is the most impossible thing anyone's ever done. Yep. Um, she, so, and she also is from New York. She's coached at Syracuse and New Hampshire. So the truth of the matter is she's not married to California. I think she's just taking jobs out there because people know her more out there. So more job offers have come for out there. That happens a lot. Well, and I don't want to make anybody mad, but maybe they're a little open, a little more open-minded to giving out these sorts of jobs to women. Right. Possibly. I mean, I think the Lady Vols are pretty open-minded to giving out these jobs. To I'm, not <laughs> I'm not comparing to the Lady Vols, but in general... I think a woman probably has a better opportunity to get a better job on the West Coast than in the South. Is that fair to say? Okay, I'll give you that. Um, so <laughs> she treated a little bit better, but anyway, maybe that's just me. But yeah, so she's at UC USC now. I think Tennessee could definitely offer her a pretty good contract. And here's the other thing, and Dave, what have I always said? The most untapped market in college football, and I think it applies to women's college basketball too, uh, for coaches are Ivy League graduates who know the game. Because I have love, said... love saying this. Is she an Ivy well, League I have, graduate? She went to Brown. Her parents are Ivy League graduates. Um, I love this because I've said for a long time, too often we all watch college football games and the coaches are... It's, it's baffling how much less intelligent they are than the average person watching the game. Is that fair to say? Yes. And if you get some... Is it also fair to say that Ivy League athletes, they're not Ivy League athletes because they were athletes. They were students first, right? They actually got, they qualify for those Ivy League schools usually, don't they? They did, yes. So they're typically smart. So Lindsay Gottlieb is undeniably smart. And I don't know she's about undeniably. She's a Brown graduate. She's a, from a family of Ivy Leaguers. Okay. And she has a proven track record. I think she's really smart. And yeah, no, I think Lindsey Gottlieb, uh, that is my top hire far and away. Also, I'll just point this out. The last Jewish coach Tennessee hired worked out pretty well on the on the court. And it was on the men's side. But he was pretty good, right, Dave? Before he got fired for recruiting violations? <laughs> yeah, there was that. I mean, you do have to include that. Uh, I want to include the <laughs> fact that our good friend Don Self at uh, Chattanooga there in the College Dell area, he's taking care, care of you with fantastic customer service for over 40 years. They built their business on taking care of their customers in the greater Chattanooga area. They'll do that 423-396-2126, 423-396-2126, or go to donself.net, donself.net. So when you say the best coaching candidate, you're talking about realistic candidate because – it would be Mulkey or Don Staley, right? Yes, it would be Mulkey or Don Staley. Um, I mean, yeah, or even, I'm, yeah, or Gino or Emma, if you want to go there then. But, like, you're not getting any of that. Right. But here's how different Tennessee is now and where they are and where their football program was. Because you're, I, the drop down is to Lindsey Gottlieb, right? Mm -hmm. That's yes. the drop down. And I think she's gettable. So your drop down previously was a guy named Derek Dooley who had a losing record in at Law Tech. I mean, this is this is the one you've got to get right because your next hire, if this doesn't go right, if they hire somebody that's a bust in five years, then your next drop down is going to be a lot lower than somebody who is currently one of the hottest young coaches in women's college basketball. You're not going to get the same option that you got. This is your last good option. You, and we Worley, don't just mean hottest in one way. <laughs> oh, no, no. I don't, I don't mean. But, but the, Warlick was a transition because she was the assistant. She was the right-hand woman. Uh, Harper was your first decision, which was a bad decision, wasn't ready. This is your decision. I mean, I, I can't overstate this. 
this is the decision to make sure that Tennessee is not just relevant, but championship level relevant. And there are about 10 to 14 programs that are at that level. Tennessee needs to get back into that. And if they make a bad hire here, I don't know when they, if ever, get back into it. That's heartbreaking to say. Yeah, well, I mean, it always comes out of nowhere when you get back into it. How many string of bad hires did Tennessee have in football before they got back into it with Josh Heifel? I mean, it just, it happens overnight. Yeah. And, you, you know, a lot of times you don't know where the success is going to come from. That's why, look, I'll say this with Danny White because I, I, I covered the Josh Heifel hiring. Guys, Danny White could have somebody on his radar that none of us, none of us are knowing about. Um, I'm going to just give you a quick story, Dave, on uh, Danny White's first primary hire was when he was at Buffalo, and it was a women's basketball hire. He hired Felicia Leggett-Jack. Now, I want you to know this, Dave. Felicia Leggett-Jack had just been fired by Indiana for going 14-16, and 9-20, and 20, and then 6-24. and 24. That's usually Dude. that you're never getting a job after that, right? No, you're not going to go get somebody that's 14 and 16, typically. And 9 and 24, or 6 and 24 was her last year. Danny White hired her. She turned Buffalo into a preeminent MAC NCAA tournament team. And now she's at Syracuse doing incredibly well. Only Danny White saw how she could be good. Okay, but let me let me try to pin you down a little bit here. What did he see? That's, I've, look, I have done my thorough research on Felicia Leggett Jack. I don't know what went wrong at Indiana and what went right at Buffalo and Syracuse. I don't know how Danny White knew about it and nobody else did. There's some explanation that goes beyond her coaching failures at Indiana. And I don't know, but Danny White sees things nobody else sees when he makes these hires and he hires from, and, and one of the things he also understands very well, Danny White knows when a hire is a good fit for a school. So Scott Frost getting fired in Nebraska, you might say it looks bad on Danny White since Danny White found Scott Frost at UCF. Well, Scott Frost's system, Dave, as you know, is much better in Florida where you can get the athletes than it is in Nebraska. Yeah. Like, I mean, but, but just because of numbers, just like sales. Just because of numbers. If you have, if exactly. you have 100 people in the pipeline at Florida and you just need to get one to be that, say, Calvin Johnson type uh, when Georgia Tech was running the triple option, you need one difference maker. Um, he could play running back or whatever, or not not to get sideline on a receiver, but uh, to get that one difference maker, you've got a hundred people in the pop line in the general area of UCF. You've got ten people in the pop line of Nebraska. Exactly, exactly, and that's why Danny White understood. I think he hired Scott Frost because he knew Scott Frost was a fit for the system. He hired Josh Heupel at Tennessee in large part because. Also, we hired Josh Heupel at UCF. His understanding was these tempo-based offenses are perfect in Florida where you can get the athletes. And he knew that it fits at Tennessee because Tennessee, with the NIL and the region and everything like that, can get the athletes too. Danny White knows how to hire. Half of hiring, and you know this, Dave, is hiring the coach who actually is a good fit for the school they're at. And mm -hmm. I think Danny White understands that incredibly well. And so if anybody... Danny White might find a hire guys out of the blue that we've never heard of. And everybody on Monday will be criticizing the hire because they felt so underwhelmed because he does that. And then two years from now, everybody's going to say, I can't believe this amazing hire he made. That's exactly what happened with Josh Heupel. Remember how angry Tennessee fans were the Josh Heupel hire Dave a few years ago. And I, I, yes and no, I, man, I try to tune so much of that out. Now there is one, lady that I think we're ruling out of a potential Tennessee candidate. I want to tell you why, because um, uh, Caleb was was uh, smart enough to find this. It's brought to you by the Hemp House, the premier hemp dispensary online with a wide variety, great selection and strict standards to ensure you only receive the best in CBD or Delta products. Hemp House chat with two T's.com. Hemp House chat with two T's.com. Use the promo code hooked. It's hooked for 10% off. So, you got one young lady uh, at Ole Miss, I believe, who might be off Tennessee's list. And why, Caleb? Yes, uh, I am going to 180 my talk on Yolette McPhee McQueen today, who I really liked at Ole Miss. But it speaks to your character when you make certain hires as assistants and staff members. And she made a hire yesterday that is the most disturbing hire I've seen. It's a guy named Quentin Hillsman who was the head coach at Syracuse from 2006 to 2021. Felicia Leggett-Jack, actually, who we just mentioned, has now replaced Quentin Hillsman at Syracuse. Um, one, just on a – now, this isn't as big of a deal because he it could be a misunderstanding. I could believe that. 
Uh, but in 2011, he owed $14,000 in back taxes to the state of New York when he was a coach. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Women's basketball salaries aren't like men's. Maybe he was bad with his money for a minute and he had to figure something out. Whatever. 14000 is a lot of money, though, isn't it, Dave? In back it's a good taxes. amount of money, but the IRS deals in bigger numbers as well. That's true. So there was that. <laughs> In 2011, former Syracuse player uh, Lene Lampkins accused him of inappropriate behavior, and her father filed a Title IX sexual harassment complaint against the university. Um, Lampkins originally reported the incident in 2010, stating he inappropriately touched and texted her. Now, independent counsel invested the accusation, found no evidence of harassment. In 2021, the Athletic published an article that Hillsman would often use inappropriate language, regularly threaten players, make players, quote, this is the weird part, uncomfortable by kissing this them on the, the forehead. This, whenever, whenever you have to say that, this is the weird part. Then the rest yes. of it's been pretty darn weird, too. Exactly. Uncomfortable by kissing them on the forehead. Hired an assistant who had been accused of sexual harassment that made both players and managers uncomfortable and refused to give them water breaks after periods of running, which, okay, that's like some old school Bear Bryant coaching. And he, this in is the, the person that Caleb wanted uh, Tennessee to hire yesterday. I'm just telling you. I stand corrected. And okay, a, a universe, an external investigation found that Syracuse mishandled concerning behavior and complaints, and a number of players and managers described an unhealthy environment and culture. That's according to the Daily Orange. And so that brings back the original harassment claim where there was found there was no evidence. Well, how objective was that independent counsel? And the Syracuse athletic director in 2021 announced that he had resigned. Well, he had resigned from the position, but Syracuse is acknowledging that they maybe did not handle this right. This is who she hired as an assistant on her staff. And I was actually really big on her as a rising star in, in the women's game. Like Tennessee Molly, settled a Title IX Molly, lawsuit go. You years ago. Cursed. You just cursed her. I didn't curse her. I didn't make the decision. She made the decision to hire this guy. It After is. all of this, she made the decision to hire this guy. And four Downs brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas Four Seasons for Four Downs. Use the just the term off the sports. You get five hundred dollars off there in that showroom in Athens. I'll tell you more about that. We're talking some Tennessee football. How about? Hitting that like button if you want to talk some spring ball. Subscribe if you haven't to this point. Make sure you give us a review and have your notifications on. Spring ball now. Four Downs brought to you by Dynasty Pools and Spas. Four Downs brought to you by Dynasty Spas. The most comfortable spas made in the United States of America. Right here in East Tennessee. Drop in for the all-new showroom in Athens. Dynasty Spas, perfect for all four seasons. Four Downs, presented by Off the Hook Sports. At Tennessee on the practice field as uh, Josh Heupel and several other Vols uh, being uh, in in. Uh, it, it, with, with the media, I should say, after camp. So let's go ahead and uh, get started with down number one as I stumble all over my words. Coop, what should people do? Cooper Mays here. Hit like and subscribe. All right. Coop here. First down. All right. Tennessee's uh, spring practice, as we ride on off the hook sports, is about instilling confidence. We discussed this yesterday. I don't want to say he's the comeback player of the year because there have been players with injuries. But I want to ask you this, Caleb, and that is Dante Thornton. Do you feel confident that he can be an all-SEC type of player? Because coaches continue to refer to the fact that he's doing a really good job in spring camp. And they said, quote, last year with where we were at with the guys that we had, we started him in the slot. That doesn't sound like an ideal situation. It sounds like Josh Heupel and his coaching staff are admitting they may have made a mistake with him. That's exactly what it sounds like. And that's as far as Josh Heupel ever go to admitting he made a mistake because Josh Heupel never admits he made mistakes. Um, for those who quick re re history, Josh Heupel said that they didn't see that Hinden Hooker was better than Joe Milton in practice because there wasn't a difference. That's a straight up lie. Hinden Hooker was better than Milton in practice. Heupel just wanted to go with Milton. Um, in this situation, you're right. He all but admitted that they tried to force him into the slot and they shouldn't have. And so quite honestly, um, the excitement level that I had for Dante Thornton this time last year is kind of coming back now again, spring practice in this coaching staff is filled with so many lies 
in so many misleading statements. And half of it is I debate on, are these players really standing out, Dave? Or is Josh Heupel trying to force a narrative of them standing out because he wants them to be that great? Well, and remember, some are standing out because Rue McCoy is not participating. So there's an opportunity to do more at the outside. So spring camp is what spring camp is. I mean, let's not let's not <laughs> pretend this is the, these are real scrimmages. So you do have to take that with a grain of salt. But for the second time in spring camp, if Josh Heupel is as manipulative of things he says uh, in the media and he is that contrived, then you got to think he's trying to pump up Mike Matthews because he was a topic of discussion twice. How good can this guy be in year one? Cooper Mays here, second down. Yeah, for the second time, Josh Heupel, and I don't think he wanted to promote a Matthews narrative, but mentioned him as one of the guys that stood out. That just doesn't happen with freshmen that are midterm guys. Matthews may be Tennessee's next star. I think we talk about the upper echelon of Nico – Pierce, McCoy, from what I've been told, if healthy, maybe this is the next guy that pushes himself into that sort of grouping. I think that Mike Matthews has, I'm, I'm going there. I think he has rare talent. I think he long-term will actually end up being better than Bruce McCoy. Um, I think Mike Matthews is a, I think 2025, Nico and Mike Matthews become the greatest QB receiver duo in the history of Tennessee football. Ooh. Like they are going to beat Peyton Manning, Joey Kent. That's the gold standard, right? Peyton Manning, Joey Kent. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to, they're, they're going to beat that. They're, 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 they will have that beat by 20, in, in, by 2025, 2025. We will be saying Peyton Manning, Joey Kent. Um, Poor Casey Clawson never really had a go-to receiver outside of his sophomore year in 2001. 2002 and 2003, he was stuck with, as you know, very mediocre receiving in that moment. So that's really the only elite quarterback-receiver combo that ever that you can think over a sustained period of time at Tennessee was Peyton Manning, Joey Kent, when I look back. And let's be honest, it was just Peyton Manning more than it was Joey Kent. <laughs> yeah, but, definitely was. Um, I think in this case, you have Nico and Mike Matthews, too superstar players at their positions. Yeah, you're going to – look, I'm, I'm – you might – I don't know if this has ever happened, but could you see a Heisman winner and a Bolitnikoff winner in the same year from Tennessee between those two? I almost don't think they would do that even if they should. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I just don't get the feeling that we would that they would do that. All right, uh, what down is it, Cooper? Tennessee center Cooper Mays here, third down. All right. The other thing that was said that I thought was interesting is that Tennessee came in with a strategic plan of building their defensive front up before they built their secondary up. Do you believe that or did it just kind of fall into place like that? Because Lane Kiffin wasn't going to take Eric Berry and say, hey, well, he's no big deal. Let's focus on the front. I mean, did it just kind of fall out that way where Tennessee not only had some guys in place, but also had some guys that were interested in Tennessee and they panned out more than the defensive backs? I think I think it somewhat fell out that way because of all the players that hit the portal for Tennessee and the defensive backs. I do think it fell on that way, but I also think Josh Heupel's system is geared towards putting more pressure. You, it's more important to have elite defensive linemen. Is that fair to say? Yes. To really get things started. So because of that, to go back to Danny White being an elite hire, maybe Danny White saw this. Maybe Danny White saw the secondary was going to be an issue for a few years. And he was going to say, I need a coach who can be complimentary to that early on because of how, how much it'll struggle. And maybe that's why he hired Josh Heupel. Maybe he's that smart, Dave. Uh, could be. Let's get to fourth down. Fourth down is right now. Again, it's brought to you by friends at Dynasty Pools and Spas. Uh, fourth down, what player defensively, and I'm going to give you one name, needs to take the biggest step? And I want to hear it on our message board as well as I tell you about Dynasty Pools and Spas. Now, I've said it before. Support our sponsors, so make sure you go by 
and say hello and off the hook sports sent you and you'll save five hundred dollars but just take a gander they'll deliver it to you dynasty pools and spas what player needs to take the biggest step on defense pick one here you know the best thing about dynasty pools and spas is that they've got it all taken care of what does that mean well you stop by their showroom and check out their fantastic selection of top-notch spas in that showroom in athens make your pick and get ready because dynasty pools and spas delivers within 125 miles of that location in athens that fantastic showroom they've got the cover the cover lifts steps chemicals and everything you need delivery at no extra charge that just down the road in athens you pick the spa you want and it'll be there for you oftentimes discounted with military and first responders discounts also blemish models or just mention off the hook sports that's off the hook sports for 500 dollars off there's a discount for you on spas made right here in east tennessee support local dynasty pools and spas also has the best chemicals for you and your spa and your pool no fillers just the chemicals made right here in east tennessee support local dynasty pools and spas 500 dollars off if you mention off the hook sports 500 dollars off if you mention off the hook sports Dynasty Pools and Spas, DynastyPoolsAndSpas.com. So who's your step-up guy? Who's your step-up guy on the message board? The guy that needs to step up, the guy that needs the most out of either the spring or the off-season. We got Boo Carter, Arian Carter. We got Tyree West. Great boats there. All of them. Who is yours? Mine's actually Mine. not a person. It is... Uh, a, a a portion of a person's body. Okay, <laughs> that's not weird at all. No, that's not um, weird. By the way, I wanted to I wanted to take your son to Six Flags at some point. Okay, go ahead. Why don't you start, Dave? I'm actually not interested. Sorry. I, I, why don't you start? Mine is Keenan Pilly's tricep muscle. <laughs> It really is, because that's a freaky injury that does not scare me. We're like down the road in the middle of the season. Once that heals, that heals. I knew somebody at the gym that underwent that. Once they staple it in, it's fine. It's gross. It's painful. It hurts. But that's it. Just that it's completely fine. And can you imagine? With, we haven't talked much about this, Caleb, but... Do you want to name for a second all the defensive tackles, the interior defensive linemen that Tennessee has coming back and the fact that they could have a true mean Mike? Not to mention, I mean, this is a huge compliment. Polynesian linebacker behind them. I mean, this could be a tough physical group, not just an edge rushing group. Well, that's why my my name was, and I was going to change it. I just wanted, that's, I wanted to make sure you said it first. I didn't want to take yours, but... um. I'm going off your reporting and I'm going Elijah Simmons. It's my step up mm. guy because if Elijah Simmons steps up and becomes what you say he can with Amari Thomas and that rotation, Bryson Eason, these guys we're talking about, that is a scary defensive line. At that point, I will say that this defensive line is better than the 2001 defensive line. If that can happen. And that's rare. So yeah, I'm going to go Elijah Simmons and um, oh, imagine Elijah Simmons like having to command two guys in the middle and then just sending Keenan Peely on a blitz if he's fully healthy. Yep, they're pretty good. And not to also. mention Arian Carter's speed too, an outside linebacker. I mean, I think that look, we're, I'm going to say this much. And Dave, we have been hard on him. Joe Milton dealt like struggled in a lot of ways last year, and that held a lot of things back. Based on what we're talking about now, there were a lot of other extenuating factors that held different units back as well, though. It was it was a transition year a lot of in a lot of ways across the board on the team. You you've said something that has kind of rubbed me the wrong way a couple of times. And it was so minor I didn't say it, but you said load it up for this season. I don't believe coaches actually do that. And I'm not going to concede that they do because of the nico situation which he didn't play last year you were right they didn't want him to get hurt i'll give you that i i and there are a couple of reasons i'm not going to concede but the one reason that i am close to conceding to you that josh heupel is loading up for 2024 is he let every defensive back go that even thought about going i don't think he tried to talk anybody to stay 
I thought he, he thinks you're just not athletic enough. That makes me think that your loaded up theory actually has some merit. Because then you're saying, I'm not only going to go in here with somebody I practice with, like that Nico guy. I'm going to go in there with a bunch of dudes that I haven't spent a significant amount of time with. And here we go. Hope it works out in the secondary. Dave, think about it this way. Think about pro football or pro sports for a minute. How often do you see teams restructure salary deals and put in contracts that put them in place to they wait for a specific year where they can load up to make a run at the Super Bowl? I'm not arguing that, but these are 18 and 19 year old kids. It, but college football is going the route of the pros with the NIL and the transfer portal. Just but how like many when, times when you were an 18 or 19 year old freshman or sophomore at UT did you say, you know, that 320 class doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun. I think I'm going to go down to the strip where I know they don't card me. I mean, th th there's a lot riding on these kids, I guess is my point. And yes, by yes, the way. Yes, Josh Heupel's taking a huge risk. He's taking a gigantic risk. A much bigger risk than teams make in the NFL. But in the NFL, teams do load up for a year for the Super Bowl knowing that they may not be as great after or that they may not be as great before, but they go all in on a year when they think they got their best chance at a run. The Marlins did that twice in baseball. They did it's it twice. Bro, it's pro. We we have to do it. Like pro now with NIL and the transfer portal. This was the plan from the start. One of those topics, I thought you're absolutely crazy, and now you're winning me over. The show represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win. Banks and Jones? Well, it's because they're Tennessee's trial attorney. You can play to win with Banks and Jones because they'll go to trial. You've heard of other lawyers. They say they'll go to trial and fight for you. They won't. They just want to settle. That's the easiest way out. Well, that's not Banks and Jones, led by T. Scott Jones. They won't settle. They'll go to trial for you. Tennessee's trial attorney. They play to win. Truly, Tennessee's trial attorney when it comes to criminal defense or personal injury. Why settle? It's Banks and Jones. T. Scott Jones. Banksandjones.com. All right, so Tennessee loses a player in the transfer portal. We want to discuss that right now. Hang tight with Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker, and we'll get into that player loss. I don't think it was a great stunning surprise, but we'll discuss the potential loss there and what that means uh, for this program. With Caleb, I'm Dave off Doug Sports. Ford Mustang 5.0 GT, 33540, 2021 GMC, Sierra, 1500 Denali 4x4, 46980, 2022 Ford Expedition, King Ranch 4x4, 67550. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. Sports Treasures in North Knoxville is one of the South's largest sports cards and memorabilia dealers featuring over 10 million sports cards from vintage to modern. Sports Treasures carries a full line of hobby boxes, singles, autographed memorabilia, Tennessee ball collectibles, fan cave decorations, and so much more. See a museum full of collectibles at Sports Treasures, 4819 North Broadway in Fountain City, and Sports Treasures on Facebook. Sports Treasures, where the real sports fan goes to shop. Have you seen the latest TriStar Hats Co. product? TriStar Hats Co., what's that? You know, those really cool hats, shirts, tumblers, and even license plates with three stars like the official Tennessee flag and stripes like the American flag. Pretty patriotic if you ask me. Ah, gotcha. Seen those. Those are cool. Where can I get them? Simple. TriStarHatsCo.com. And if you order now, there's 10% on any order $50 or more. Plus, use the promo code HOOKED. With the promo code HOOKED, you get 10% off. That's HOOKED. And don't forget free shipping with any order over 50 bucks. Stock up at TriStarHatsCo.com. That's TriStarHatsCo.com. There are plenty of wannabes out there, so make sure you go to TriStarHatsCo.com for the best quality and customer service. Will do, and I'll be sure to use the promo code HOOKED. That's HOOKED when I do to save an additional 10% off. TriStarHatsCo.com. TriStar Hats Co. is a trademark of TriStar Hats Co. LLC. Any use without express written consent is prohibited. Now in its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be, we still try to live up to that. Joe Newbert Collision Center. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones. 
Tennessee's trial attorney. Speech. Play to win. Banksjones.com. Um, who's this guy? Hello, wizard. The Dave Hooker Show. Ooh. A presentation of Off the Hook Sports. What? YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. Back to Dave Hooker. I don't think I've asked yet. So please, if you will, hit like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate that. Also, if you would like to join our Hooker's Corner Patreon group, we would love to have you on that as well. Caleb, can you give us an update of the latest poll question? We were discussing who the Lady Vols should hire. What, what do we got on that? Because I would like to reset that. I've got a, I got a good thought. At least I think it's a good thought. But I'll right now share the uh, Hooker's Corner Patreon page. I remind you that if you sign up for there, just $9.98 a month, you'll be eligible for those fantastic prizes from uh, Sports Treasures, carrying over $5 million Sports Treasures. Follow them on Facebook, Sports Treasures TN. That's Sports Treasures TN. You can check out the page right there, and I will put that in the link. If you want to join, do that. If you'd rather just uh, have some interaction with us, you can do that too for free. That doesn't cost anything. But if you want to join for $9.98, well, weekly and and uh, and monthly prizes to give away, which I guess we I need to give away a weekly prize actually at some point uh, today. All right, uh, Caleb Calhoun, so people can join Hooker's Corner. You too can be a John. But let's get back to what we were discussing. Tennessee without DJ Burns has been a topic of conversation. For those that don't know, who is DJ Burns and what is his tie to Tennessee and why is he a topic of discussion in Knoxville as the Final Four is unfolding? DJ Burns was actually a four-star commitment to Tennessee in 2018. He was he kind of rode the bench um, for Tennessee um, that year when they were loaded with that was the Grant Williams Admiral Schofield year. He was kind of seen as the future of that. He very quickly hit the transfer portal a year later, went to Winthrop, and then has since transferred to NC State. Now has NC State in the Final Four. Everybody's excited about the NC State Purdue matchup because even though Purdue is the one seed, NC State's the 11 seed, DJ Burns' width is the type of width you want when you're guarding a Zach Eady because that's your best way to not allow all those offensive rebounds that happen in the game. Because as you know, Dave, Tennessee did not have, they had tall players, they had athletic players, they didn't have anybody that was just wide, they didn't have any girth really. So the question is going to become, would the girth of DJ Burns have helped Tennessee beat Purdue last week? Would they be in the final four if they had him? Yes, they would. Yeah. Yeah. There's no. Yeah. Assuming that he wasn't a complete jerk. And if he stayed around Tennessee for what's that three years, then Mm -hmm. he would have overcome his jerkiness that he apparently had when he showed up, because that's why Rick Barnes didn't want him. And if Rick Barnes didn't want you, aren't you going to take the side of Rick Barnes more time than not, Caleb? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely, I will. Yeah, so I would take the side of Rick Barnes, and I think Rick Barnes would eventually turn him into a solid player. I I think that weight was told to me as it was a little bit of uh, an issue. I think that Rick Barnes would have turned him into a solid player, and he'd be on a Final Four team. It just wouldn't be the same team that he's on now. Um, It'd be a better team probably be a better team. I'm not so sure though. I like Edie a little bit more than you do. I'm not so sure that he would have beaten Edie, but Tennessee's chances would have been vastly, vastly improved. They needed one guy to go out there and, you know, muscle the guy up and be able to win some of those leverage battles because you don't win. I'm not making excuses. The officials had a terrible game, but you don't win those battles if you're losing leverage all the time. And they just never had a leverage, Caleb. Never. Never. That was a huge problem. And think about the irony of that with DJ Burns not wanting to wait. He didn't get to emerge until this year anyway. So wouldn't he, don't you think he looks back and it's like, man, I could have emerged like this at Tennessee and I'd have Dalton Connect playing next to me and we'd be a one seed favored to win the national title right now. Instead, yes, they're in the final four, but I mean, they're not winning the national title. I can tell you that over the next two games. 
Don't you feel like, though, there are some players who just show up and they're like, I don't want any part of this burn stuff. This practice is hard right up and through March. Don't you feel like there are some guys that they they should know it, even if it's just through an official visit, but they, they've got to know it pretty early. This is not a great fit for me. Possibly, but that's, um, I mean, look, that's, if your goal is the NBA, that's really short-sighted. Because the oh, NBA you know, it's, it's an indictment of their character, which then would probably keep someone from saying this practice is too hard for me because they have poor character and the character would also be cocky and tell them I can handle this. Yeah, exactly. Let's <laughs> also be fair here to this. Dave, we just talked 18 and 19 year olds. This is the problem. I, I guess this is the joy for coaches in college athletics, but the problem too, the character of an 18 year old is not always the same as the character of a 22 of what they are at 22. They can grow up and be mature and really, how many people did you cover in, at Tennessee football over the years that they were just annoying, obnoxious head cases when they got on campus. And then two years later, they were one of the best people to cover. There, there are probably a lot of people you covered like that, weren't there? Yeah, a lot of people would change. A lot of people would change the other direction too. Well, yeah, some people get good and then they think they're too big. They're, they're too good for the program. I totally agree. Um, so maybe DJ Burns has grown up and has, is, is thinking about this totally differently. There's also this factor because, you know, Rick Barnes made Admiral Schofield trim so much weight when he got to Tennessee. Do you think it's possible that Rick Barnes would not allow DJ Burns to be as wide as he is right now and was demanding yes. that he, that he trim up and like, which would hurt his leverage that Tennessee would need him to have against Edie? Yes. You can still have good leverage, though. It's what you do with your feet and the way you move your, your body. I mean, you can still have good leverage without having the weight. Um, so, yeah, I, I, what that happy medium would have been, I don't know. I don't know if he would have been a stretch guy that would have played on the perimeter and tried to take it to the rack. I don't think so. I think he's more of a post player. Uh, I, I know what, what they've got at Rick Terry Jewelry Design, and they want to be your jeweler. If you're looking for affordable game day jewelry, how about the Fire Opals, the Tennessee tradition? Go to rickterryjewelry.com, rickterryjewelry.com. We certainly appreciate them. As uh, Caleb, I think that Tennessee would have benefited from one more big guy in there. I still, not to beat a dead horse, but I don't know with uh, Adu what happened there. It seemed like he was talked out of that game before it even started. It's exactly what it seems like. I think Adu, I've told you guys this for a while. I think Adu is just soft. I think when you, and this is a problem again for big men, particularly as that you go deeper in the tournament. When you punk a guy, you, you can be soft and finesse on the perimeter. You know, it's not the 80s in basketball. You're allowed to be soft and finesse and not able to handle certain things. Clay Thompson is one of the softest players in history, and he's been great in the NBA for years. But under the basket, you get punked. You got to be able to fight back. I my, I have no inside reporting on this, Dave. Not like I did on actually Blake Griffin back in the day, but I have none on Jonas Adu, but I've watched enough. It's very clear that when you cheap shot him or punk him under the basket, he wants no part of it. He backs off. He doesn't want to fight back. And guys, that is a huge problem for big men because they can be a human highlight reel like Blake Griffin, but they'll never be a champion because getting punked like that knocks you, totally holds you back. Um, there this, were... Uh, SEC football said, I think Euros Plastic would have put it to 80. With he'd have been five, five minutes in though. <laughs> Yeah, but I think you're kind of okay with that because it would have been hard fouls. I think he would have done as good or better than Burns. I don't think he would have done better than Burns. Okay. But mainly because of the offensive side. You realize how bad Plastic, the Plastic's issue was every time he got a rebound on offense, he'd bring the ball down and then lose it. Okay, so it's it's that was a big problem with Plastic. There, I know I'm, I'm, I'm like, get tougher, but then I don't like players like Plastic that make so many mistakes on the court. But then all they do is be tough, I guess. But it costs our team in so many other ways. Plavchik is like, oh, this is a great comparison for you, Dave. You know who Plavchik is? Do you remember some of those games when Julian Battle played at Tennessee where Julian Battle would get cooked on the field, but then he'd get like three personal foul penalties in a row at the same time? I think he did that in the Peach Bowl one year. And uh, don't remember that, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, Julian Battle had a bad habit of defensive was, back. Tennessee, yes. Yeah, defensive back for Tennessee. There was one game, I think it was that Peach Bowl lost to Maryland, where Julian Battle got cooked down the sideline 
consistently. And then when he didn't get cooked, he got a 15 yard penalty every time. And so he, it was like, it was like, just get him out of there. And now Julian battle was maybe just trying to rally up his team because nobody wanted to be in that game. But still that was Flachik. Flachik would play like garbage, but he'll still get you some technicals. So it's like, well, wait a minute here. <laughs> that's, that's, that's problematic the other way. No, but I would take some, I would take some good physical plastic, um, fouls. Those are a little harder than those Estrella. I'm just trying to lean against you and do the best I possibly can. I thought Estrella mm. played superb defense against Edie. So Estrella actually, if anything, Estrella just laid the book on why Edie isn't going to be that successful in the NBA. Yeah, but I'm I'm way past defense. I'm like dirty play, break a forearm. That's you and I are in, <laughs> you and I are in two different You're... places. I'm like the guy has punked you the whole game. It's try it's time to break his. But his, Edie didn't punk yeah. him though. That's the thing. Estrella actually legitimately. I know, Estrella's... but he's punked your team. He's punked your team. But Tennessee got back in the game because of Estrella's defense. The only reason he couldn't close the deal is because they t- made some offensive mistakes down the stretch. Mm-hmm. But they got back into the game because Estrella knew that if you force Edie to use his left hand, he's got problems. And he consistently did that. And I think that's a big indictment of Edie. But, yeah, you wouldn't have to be, like, smart like that with Burns. You could just Burns could just, like, out-muscle Edie. Because I don't know how you feel, Dave. I, Edie, sh- this is unfair to say because no one's tested him on it. He strikes me as soft, though. But am I just saying that because he's so tall he looks lanky? Ooh, I think he's the opposite. You think he's, you think he's, yeah. To me, this sounds like I'm stereotyping, but he's Drago from Rocky three or four. He's Drago. I mean, I think he's super tough and I think he's going to be able to bully people around at some point. He's going to get punched in the nose. How does he react? Okay. That's the question. I I mean, is he going to be able to react? And I don't even mean physically punched in the nose. I mean, somebody just lays down a quick 15 on him. is like cramming it on him. He's like, oh, my like gosh. Yeah, whether it's cheap shot or physical or not, somebody's going to challenge him at some point in this tournament. And that's the tournament. The this is represent. where you need. Yeah, that's that's it. You know who, if Jonas Adu got his mind right, you know who he'd have the potential to be, but he won't get his mind right, so he can't be? Don't tell me yet because I want to remind people the show is represented by Banks and Jones. Then you'll tell me. That's a tease, kids. Banks and Jones? Well, it's because they're Tennessee's trial attorney. You can play to win with Banks and Jones because they'll go to trial. You've heard of other lawyers. They say they'll go to trial and fight for you. They won't. They just want to settle. That's the easiest way out. Well, that's not Banks and Jones led by T. Scott Jones. They won't settle. They'll go to trial for you. Tennessee's trial attorney. They play to win. Truly, Tennessee's trial attorney when it comes to criminal defense or personal injury. Why settle? Banks and Jones. T. Scott Jones. Banksandjones.com. All right. Who does he remind you of, Edie? No, no, no. Not Edie. Jonas Adu. If Jonas Adu could have punked right. Edie. Okay. Here's who he should take lessons from. Rashid Wallace. Uh, that's not a bad comparison. If he got tougher, he could be a Rasheed Wallace. You know, the other thing that I thought was always frustrating about going against Rasheed is that he could slip out there on the baseline and hit that jumper. So you have to play yep. like legit defense against him, which isn't fun. And then he comes down and he's throwing those skinny little elbows. He's got those skinny type elbows that he used to hate playing against. That's a pretty good comparison. I was, I was wondering which direction you were going to go there as uh, he always goes the right direction. He's even winning money. Thanks to Bet US, that's because they've got the three time 125% bonus that boom, you get 125% of your money and the 10% gambler's insurance. Bet US. America's favorite sports book and casino. Live betting and race book. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. Hey, do me a favor, if you don't mind, if you're a gambler, go ahead and sign up for that. Check out the bonus, and then I want to hear back from you because we're excited about some things we're doing with BetUS, but I want to make sure everything's good with you and our community enjoys that. So uh, that's something we want to get into this day in Tennessee sports history. Also on the program uh, with Caleb Calhoun, I'm Dave Hooker. Uh, A judge has denied a motion 
for the the ACC's lawsuit to continue. Now, I'm going to get Caleb to explain this a lot better, but what I think it means is uh, perhaps that the the NCAA is getting closer and closer and closer to having this mega conference, and then also Tennessee with the transfer out of their program. Let's get to Freddie DeLeon, if you don't mind, Caleb. How significant of a loss is that? What are your thoughts? You know, I in this era of the transfer portal, Dave, I can't tell you how many people I thought were the future of Tennessee, and then they entered the transfer portal in basketball. So on that regard, I would think it's significant because I feel like Freddie DeLeon had rare potential for for college basketball. We're talking about 6'5", 195-pound guy. Um, I know he was only 28.6% from three this year, but he was considered a sharpshooter. I thought if he started shooting more, he would get into rhythm and become a really big threat for Tennessee. However, I think that it's just what we talked about with DJ Burns. He either has not been willing to put in the work that Rick Barnes demands, or maybe Rick Barnes, and this is the big part of the transfer portal you guys start to understand. Maybe Rick Barnes is going for a couple other guys in the transfer portal, and he needs a little more room. And so basically just said, see you, Freddie. Um, you're not really going to play, so you may want to look elsewhere. And I think that could be possible. I think the biggest thing, though, is Tennessee. They got a lot of questions next year about their backcourt scoring. Dalton Connect is gone. Whatever you think of Sandy Vascovi and Josiah Jordan James, they were solid, solid players, at least defensively. They're both gone. You Jordan Ganey is the only returning rotational player from your backcourt that's not a point guard. Jordan Ganey and Zakai Ziegler is it, and that's if Zakai Ziegler doesn't go pro. So Rick Barnes has a lot of work to do to add some talent in that backcourt for next year. If you say a lot. Good. That's that's an understatement, what all they have to do with that backcourt. I mean, they're lucky to have Ziegler. If Ziegler was, what, a few inches taller, then he'd be an NBA prospect, but it his height works against him in that regard and keeps him at Tennessee a little bit longer. But you know, at what point I think is Ziegler is considered a great defender and he is, but he's got to lean on the other players that are around him too. And, and he's going to have a different crew. What do you make of Ganey going out there? And then I would imagine more points next, next year for a Waka as well. Yeah. And a Waka is the front court. I think the front court's going to be set. The front court's going to be, um, you know, Waka, Adu again, and Estrella develop. So looking at it now, so I, I spoke out of turn a little bit because there's Ganey, there's um, oh, there's Ziegler. I did forget about Jemai Meshack. Uh, I very much apologize. So Jemai Meshack, and then a couple of reserve players that I think could take a step forward: Cameron Carr and DJ Jefferson. They were we saw some potential from both of them. They were both freshmen this year. They might see a lot. It's possible all those guys are part of the rotation again this year, but I, th I don't think Barnes can afford to not take a transfer portal guy. So, my, you know, if, if no changes were made to this team, your starting lineup next year would probably be Zakai Ziegler, Jordan Ganey, Jemai Meshack, um, Jonas Adu, and I don't know if I don't know if he'd play small again or if he would have Toby Awaka and Jonas Adu win there at the same time, which that's where Barnes reverting to old school Barnes, you know, playing bigger again. So, and then, and then scoring off the bench, you would have Cameron Carr and DJ Jefferson. And then your post player off the bench would be JP Estrella. If those guys develop the way Rick Barnes players typically develop, that's not a bad situation but they don't have the depth they need to in the backcourt to be able to play small again like they had this year, which was a huge advantage for them down the stretch. I'm going to give you three different kinds of players from three different eras, but I think you'll follow along. One is a spot-up jump shooter. He is not going to miss. The other is a swing man that you've just watched play that can get to the rims and score on three levels. And the other you've just seen play, he's a big man who will frustrate the heck out of you because it seems like he never gets a foul called, nor does he get called for three seconds. And Tennessee fans hate him, and I understand why. So regardless of how good they are, you're just fitting a character, so to speak. You've got like a J.J. Redick, a spot-up shooter who's not going to miss, especially in the clutch. You've got a Zach Eady. He's that post-player type guy. Or you've got a Dalton Connect that's positionless basketball. 
He can come off the wing. He can score in a lot of different ways. I'm not saying one's better than the other, and I'm not comparing the individual players. But when it comes to that one kind of player you think Tennessee should most go after in the transfer portal, who would it be, Caleb? Oh, Dalton Connect again. Go for another Dalton Connect. And I think you can get more. I, I don't think me and you are going to break on this, and I could be so wrong. And I will, by the way, I've been right a lot the last month, but I'm going to say that Dave was right on this. Dave said about maybe two weeks into the basketball season, this Dalton Connect makes Tennessee different from any team Rick Barnes has ever coached. You did say that very early on when you watched him play. I think it was when you saw them play Kansas. And I just thought it, looked, I thought it looked like Jason Tatum had snuck down and got some sort of uh, videographic face and another jersey. And I mean, it looked like because I watch the Celtics all the time. I was like, this is the same dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think another one of those is what's important. I think that. So here's going to be my hot take where I could be wrong, but here's going to be my hot take. I don't think Dalton Connect is as a rare find in the transfer portal nowadays as you, Dave. I think Dalton Connect, there are so many elite scores of that caliber at the lower levels of college basketball that are just a little bit of Rick Barnes developing away from being all Americans. And I think that Rick Barnes should find one of those every year. It used to be you find the one and done guy. Rick Barnes' philosophy at Texas was build a team with experience, then go pick a one and done out of, you know, top five recruit, plug him in and win that way. That never actually worked because for some reason, one and done lottery picks never mesh well in Rick Barnes' system. Like they never accept their roles in Rick Barnes' system. So don't go for that at the recruiting level. Go for the transfer portal guy that has been in the league for that has been in the game for three, four years and just needs to develop one aspect of his game to be an NBA draft pick. That's what Dalton Connect was. I think there's a lot of those players that you can find in the transfer portal. A lot of players. I mean, if you, if you look at Dalton Connect, I believe was 13th best in the transfer portal. He turned out to be, I think we would all argue, the best. I mean, they had Hunter Dickinson, uh, the center who went to Kansas uh, from Michigan. You had uh, Khalil Ware from Oregon to Indiana. Grant Nelson goes to Alabama. Jesse Edwards goes to West Virginia. J.J. Starling goes to Stanford. L.J. Cryer goes to Houston. Jameer Nelson Jr. goes to TCU. Max Abram goes to Texas. Ryan Nimberhard goes to Gonzaga. And Tyler Burton goes to Nova. J.V. McCollum goes to Ohio. And then Brandon, McMur Brandon Murray goes to Ole Miss just before Connect. None of those guys turned out to be superstars. They were higher rated than Dalton Connect, but they weren't superstars. So I think you're being a little bit, Caleb, optimistic that Tennessee can just go pick up a connect each and every year. Which one of them went to play for Rick Barnes? Ooh, uh, the Dalton Connect guy did. I think a huge part of this was Rick Barnes and his coaching, and Dalton Connect bought in very fast to what he was doing. And I think well, and he supposedly asked for it too. And a lot of those TV stories, they'll talk about, oh, Dalton Connect, uh, he walked uphill both ways in the snow with no <laughs> shoes and to get to school. A lot of those stories are embellished, but the part where he's really wants to be coached and he didn't care about NIL money, that that is true. A lot of that is true. So he, he turns down money to get do autographs all the time. He is not a guy who's thinking about money. So uh, there's well, I mean, me. let's see, he may be thinking about money, but he's not short sighted. He's thinking about the NBA draft money, not the college nil money because he knows that's where the wealth is quite honestly and so i, I you say it all the time you you, you use the calipari quote tripping over nickels in search of millions i mean dom connect is a veteran experienced player who's had some years on him now has is mature and probably thought why waste a year on nil money when i could spend it to really build my nba draft profile and the nba draft is not like the nfl draft guys you get nba money you get NBA money, you are doing really, really well. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so the top-rated guys that aren't uh, committed to a school yet, John L. Davis out of Florida Atlantic, and he is a shooting guard. And then you have Maxime Renard, who is a big dude, big center. I'm telling you, people are going to love this guy. Seven foot, 200 pounds. Uh, he is out of Stanford, and he's going somewhere. 
Uh, I'll take Reynard over the shooting guard. I'm sorry. I think there's room for that in college basketball. I think you're seeing the big man renaissance. I'm going to be on the front end of it. I'm sorry, Caleb, that you're not a part of it with me because I'm big man renaissance in this thing. And it's brought to you by Quality Tire Pro. The uh, Everly family has been serving Chattanooga since 1957. All major brands of tires, full service, automotive, brake alignments, oil changes, and more. All work is covered. Just stop by there and say off the hook. Sports says, hey, Bo. You'd appreciate that on Cherokee Boulevard. Caleb, it's a big man renaissance extravaganza. Give me some Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Give me some Moses Malone. Uh, give me the Chief, uh, Robert Parrish. That's what the uh, the college basketball game is going to be within two or three years. Dave, you're missing a huge aspect of this, though, what with the that? big men. Everybody you just named came up in an era where there were coaches that actually coached you on footwork and how to develop and play like a big man. Nobody's coached on that anymore. They're all coached on how to stretch the floor on the perimeter. You're well, somebody coached get... the Edie kid. Somebody coached the Edie kid. He's got crazy good footwork. Yeah, someone did coach Edie kid. Maybe he just played soccer. Okay, that, that that's probably I, that's... actually when football players tell me that I'm usually like, okay, he's a little bit better. It's like a when a center tells you he was a wrestler, I'm like, oh, he understands leverage. But anyway, yeah, exactly. So I mean, that's why Hakeem Olajuwon was so good. He played soccer. I mean, crazy feet. Yeah, he it, soccer was his first sport. Um, Rex Ryan will probably love his feet, but <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> guys, we had an off color joke about this before the show today, so I just want to yeah yes. with Rex, Rex Ryan. Ryan and his, feet. Yes, um, so I'm sorry, it's John L. Davis, and John L. Davis is a perfect type of guy for Rick Barnes. He's the guy I love. John L. Davis went from averaging three points a game as a freshman to averaging 18 points a game as a senior. He got a Florida Atlantic to the final four. He shot, oh, he went from shooting 23% from three to 41% from three, from 76% from the foul line to 86% from the foul line, averaging over six rebounds, averaging three assists, averaging one and a half steals. This is the type of player you love. He's a development player. He just is missing maybe one aspect of his game to become an NBA superstar. And that's where Rick Barnes can come in. This is the type of guy. And by the way, from Gary, Indiana, I'll, I'll say this, Dave, you know this. Indiana high school basketball, that's some tough basketball. Like you develop tough mentally when you play in Indiana at the high school level. Probably more than any other state in the country, honestly. I would say Indiana high school basketball is a tougher brand than North Carolina high school basketball. Is that fair to say? Uh. I mean, to me, they're not even the toughest. I would take, like you mentioned, Rucker Park. I would. Well, New York kids are the by far the toughest. Yeah. Yeah. So that Big I, E style. Yeah. Um, but I think I, that's what I love about Ziegler is he's got some of that. Can he transfer that to other players? Uh, we'll see. Tennessee uh, on the practice field, and also we have to keep an eye of what's going on in the law room. Or the courtroom, I should say. There's not a law room, is there? That you're familiar with, Caleb? Is there Never such a thing? Never heard of that. It's probably Never something you say in like Alaska or something like that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's it's good up there in Alaska. Uh, judges denied an FSU motion to dismiss an ACC lawsuit. What does that mean for the Super Conference, the Super League, the Super Friends? Because meanwhile, we have a development <laughs> of a super conference. Do you remember the super friends? The guy that used to always go, meanwhile, back at the fortress of solitude, Caleb, does anybody remember that on our message board? Can I get one thumbs up on that? Just one. I don't remember this. I'm sorry. It hurts. All right. Two minutes. I'm going to tell you how there's about to be a super conference and it's about to happen faster than you think. Record numbers this week. I don't know why. Maybe because you like us. So hit the like button. The thumbs up button helps us out a ton. And tell me if you remember the Justice League. And if you thought the Wonder Twins were a little campy or just a little cheesy. Two minutes off the hook sports. Now in its 45th year, the second and third generations continue Joe Newbert's commitment. His vision of what this business needed to be we still try to live up to that. If we wouldn't put our family in it, we're not going to put their family in it. If you're going to say that you're doing the best work in Knoxville, now saying it's one thing, producing it and providing it's another. 
The largest family-owned collision center in Knoxville is Joe Newbert Collision Center. Hi, I'm Rick Terry, and we at Rick Terry Jewelry Designs pride ourselves in the highest quality craftsmanship from a family-owned business here in Knoxville for over 35 years. At Rick Terry Jewelry Designs, we also take pride in being an affordable option for all your game day accessories, especially those fire opals. At Rick Terry Jewelry Designs, we want to be your jeweler every day and especially on game day. Go Vols! Hi, Mike Davis here with City Heating and Air, reminding you to always dare to compare. Our team provides quality local heating and air service, installation, and maintenance across East Tennessee. We use only the best equipment like American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning for your residential, new construction, or commercial needs. Honesty, dependability, and customer satisfaction have been the cornerstones of our business since 1961. City Heat and Air. There's your pair. Welcome to Ray Varner Ford in Clinton, where every turn meets new possibilities and every mile celebrates cutting edge innovation. Elevate your journey with our pre-owned selection of quality vehicles. 2021 Ford Mustang 5.0 GT 33540. 2021 GMC Sierra 1500 Denali 4x4 46980. 2022 Ford Expedition King Ranch 4x4 67550. Local you trust? Pre-owned vehicles you can afford. Ray Varner Ford, your East Tennessee Ford dealership. The Dave Hooker Show, represented by Banks and Jones, Tennessee's trial attorney. Play to win, banksjones.com. Objective coverage. Hey, that's new. If we get cut, we're going to jail. The Dave Hooker Show, a presentation of Off the Hook Sports. YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and the free Off the Hook Sports app. I'm going to need to see some identification. Back to Dave Hooker. This day in Tennessee sports history coming up here momentarily as it was this day 30 years ago that Kurt Cobain died, which is sobering to say the least and kind of hard to believe. I uh, definitely one of those who are like, remember where you are, at least for my generation. So uh, Caleb Calhoun, this day in uh, Tennessee sports history, as we bring that to you each and every day. Brought to you by our good friends at, of course, TriStar Hats. For the latest in TriStar Hats, go to the original, TriStarHatsCo.com, TriStarHatsCo.com. And it's up there. You can check out the TriStar Hats right above my left shoulder, maybe a right shoulder on your side, because it's got the mirror thing that YouTube does. I don't understand it, but that's what it does. But anyway, over one of my shoulders is a book, which you can buy, Celebrate 98, at our merch shop. On the other shoulder is a TriStar Hats Co. hat. That is awesome. Go to TriStarHatsCo.com. Use the promo code HOOKED. That's HOOKED and get free shipping. TriStar Hats Co. That's TriStar Hats Co. And they've got other fantastic memorabilia that you'll want to uh, check out. They are just incredibly awesome. And we have uh, this day in Tennessee sports history. And I love it when Caleb tells me it's a funny one because I like the funny ones. By the way, you see... The Hooker's Corner board up there. You can join for free and you'll get inside information. You can join for $9.98 and win weekly and monthly prizes. I've got a special gift we're going to give away. We didn't get uh, complete uh, okay on this approval. So we're going to give that away on Monday, but it's pretty neat. Um, it's different from your average Hooker shirt, which is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Caleb, this day in Tennessee sports history, who are we learning about today, sir? Tennessee hired Michael Jordan by proxy 23 years ago. Buzz Peterson okay. receives the job. I can remember that like it was yesterday. I remember uh, there being a press conference, and I was like, well, there's a lot of fans at this press conference, which seems kind of weird, but okay. And one of those fans, I learned that he loved – Basketball more than football, I think, was John Ward, who was there, the voice of the Vols. He was excited to see this new young whippersnapper get his chance at becoming Tennessee's head coach. And the coolest part about it is you didn't have to ask John Ward to autograph something because he had an 8 by 10 glossy of himself in his briefcase that he carried with him at all times. Nice. Nice. Did not know that. Well, John Ward did start as the basketball commentator before the football commentator, so that makes sense. Um, True. Now, did he have the glossies then? I can't attest to that. 
it was very funny because Buzz Peterson, um, for him, it was actually kind of a dream job because even though he went to UNC, you know, this day he grew up in Asheville, right across the mountains. By the way, Asheville's a heck of a town. I love Asheville. Um, he but, loved the crystals. He thought they made the crystals, the little bitty crystals for him individually. He did. Yes, when he was a My kid. My gosh. Um, it's a so, sweet, sweet uh, okay. backstory for a terrible, terrible head coach. Yes, very bad head coach. And he, but he felt he was home. He, his qualification for being hired was that he won the NIT with Tulsa, a team that had gone to the final four the year before. But, you know, yeah, they had, they, he, oh, I'm sorry, Elite Eight. He took an Elite Eight team and won the NIT. And Doug Tiki said, well, that guy's qualified for this job after one year at Tulsa going to the NIT. And not that do you think you would ever respond poorly on a basketball hire? What are you talking about? Portions of the program brought to you by Newbert Collision Center for over 50 years. Newbert Collision Center has been East Tennessee's best choice for quality repair work and fantastic, fantastic customer service. Joe Newbert Collision.com. Joe Newbert Collision.com. Yes, sir. You were going to say. Do you think that his East Tennessee ties were the biggest reason he got hired? That Doug, did you thought he'd just do well in the community? I think he just wanted to get it done. You think he was just like, <laughs> get it done. you know, I mean, it's like when you're packing and you're just like, you got, you know, you're just throwing stuff in there. It's not, I mean, it wasn't his, wasn't his favorite thing to do. I don't think he enjoyed hiring basketball coaches, I don't think he enjoyed dealing with basketball at all. So I think it was just something he got done. Somebody told him, hey, you got to pack before you go on your trip and have this next basketball extravaganza, which may or may not lead to an NIT bid. And he's like, okay, well, let's do this. How about, what's his name? Buzz? Oh, that's cool. Does he know Michael Jordan? Hiring. <laughs> Probably yet. And, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating. <laughs> probably right and his brand by the way was buzz ball yes buzz ball Which i still don't know does that mean as to buzz around the half court and hit five different people before you take a shot does that mean you buzz up and down the court i still don't know what buzz ball is the and you probably know, well you know hoops x's and o's better than me did i miss buzz ball altogether is that my bad buzz ball was just the most boring brand of offense one there was no offense I don't know if you noticed, Buzz yeah, really I had no offense. I mean, so if, if somebody can tell me on the message board what Buzz Ball is, and I got a hooker T-shirt for you. Um, I mean, it's teaching players. It's teaching players with discipline. And by the way, he said all he ever talked about. Oh my gosh, Dave! I actually remember because I just started to become a Tennessee fan during this time when he was hired. All he, how, how many times did he say that he's installing discipline? Within the first, like, year, oh my like, gosh, almost as many times as Jerry Green said they had a players only wake up call meeting. Yeah, Mike, I remember Mike Strange saying one time, Well, if this uh, team isn't woken up now, then good lord, they've had like 18 wake up calls. He's got this play <laughs> deep voice, they had like 18 wake up calls. I I've heard Ron Slay tell us about that one too, but uh, Ron Slay was part of both of these, but yeah, uh, basically. Uh, he, he was asked in the opening press conference, what have you learned, you know, from playing under Dean Smith? And he's like, well, Dean Smith just taught me you got to have discipline to run the program. And then he was like, what do you the players like about what you're doing? He's like, they like the discipline I've brought to the program. I'm like, what are you like? What? I mean, and I, and listen, I've heard a couple recently, and then I want to get to this NCAA thing, but I've heard a couple recently of coaches that have been hired on a local level. And for goodness gracious, somebody needs to work with these people. I, I have some free time that if you pay me enough, I will be willing to work with you. Because to say we're going to run a discipline program, we're going to continue on, and we're going to play at a championship level, and we're going to play hard, and we're going to play for each other. What do you think you're supposed to say there? We're going to play really undisciplined. We're going to be incredibly selfish. And we really don't care about the history. I mean, give me something else to work with. But that's just yeah, right. He said it, when he got hired later at one place, he got hired at UNC Wilmington about a decade later. And he said uh, his lead was, we're going to put a product on the floor, whether win or lose. You guys will walk out of the arena saying we didn't win this game, but these guys gave 110 percent effort. 
Are you really like you really? That's that's what you're trying to do. Put a product on that puts 110 percent effort. Like everybody isn't trying to put 100. You know, some coaches are like, I, I think we only need 70 percent effort, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's all you need. By the way, uh, a hooker ball, a uh, Smoky Mountain Red says we need to do that. I don't have to become a coach to do that. We can celebrate. This would be what year two, three, 22, 23. So we can celebrate year two. And I guess we'll have some sort of screen where we can talk to Caleb wherever he may be in the United States of America. But maybe we'll try to get Caleb down for our anniversary. But you got a big June plan with a baby and such. All right. The latest on the ACC. Should I be concerned about my ACC brethren who are facing one heck of a challenge as they try to keep their poor, pathetic conference together? You want to you want to speak for your ACC brethren, Dave? You want to go? You want you want to be their ally? I guess I'll speak for them. All I can do right now is hold their hand and wait till the bitter end. Well, they got a nice little win in court. Uh, basically, a judge has now, and this is the truth, denied a motion by Florida State to dismiss the ACC lawsuit in North Carolina. This makes it pretty likely, guys. The reason this is big: the legal battle with Florida State. And the ACC is likely going to take place in North Carolina now, which is very friendly to the ACC. Now, we had T. Scott Jones on two weeks ago. And the truth, the reason I love having T. Scott Jones on, the reason I love being on the show with Dave is this. We don't, a lot of YouTube, a lot of the YouTube media sphere, the online media sphere is telling listeners what they hope to hear so they can come back to it consistently. And so you've seen a lot of college football media tell you this ACC deal is not ironclad. It's going to break up and Florida State and Clemson will be able to join the SEC because that's what people want to see. People don't. This ACC is a big elephant in the room and an albatross on everybody's neck because it's just like it's annoying and it, it stalls the moving forward of college football. So everybody knows that that's how fans feel. So everybody in the YouTube sphere, particularly Florida State and Clemson YouTube spheres and Twitter are telling you that they're going to be able to get out of this and they're going to win the lawsuit. But guys, in terms of the legal fight between Florida State and Clemson versus the ACC in both individual cases, the ACC has a much stronger case. Because as T. Scott Jones told us two weeks ago, Florida State and Clemson have to claim they were coerced into signing these deals. Like they were some poor, struggling, independent artist getting coerced into signing a bad record deal because they had no business experience. You know, these two state public institutions that have millions and millions of dollars and tons of the best lawyers possible were coerced into signing bad deals. That's not really going to fly. So the only hope for Florida State and Clemson, I think they're losing this. Both of them are going to lose their lawsuits to the ACC. And I think the ACC is going to be fine. The only hope is that this Super League happens and all the teams from the ACC agree to leave and join it. That's it. So that would put, I don't know that we need to go beyond 14. Don't, don't get me wrong. I want a mega conference to something totally different, but if the ACC can hold it together, then how much could that delay it? Because we're eventually going to get to that 70 team thing, because when the NFL gets involved, which I don't know if you've read even more reports, but the NFL was involved in discussing putting together that plan. The NFL doesn't do a lot of, of, of things, well, except for the All-Star game, the Pro Bowl, that are total abject failures. And they're just starting to slowly, slowly pull that one out of the toilet. But other than that, they're pretty successful, Caleb. So it's going to happen. But if, if the ACC can hold this thing together, does that just delay it for an extra two, three, four years? I think they're, you know... No, because of what the Super League planned. I thought it would delay it because I thought the Super League was going to go your route, 32-40 teams and take the top teams just from everywhere. If you're going the 32-40 teams route, you're taking maybe three out of the ACC, right? Florida State, Miami, right. And Clemson. This one I think they should fold on if it gets – this gets passed and then get 10 teams in. I'm sorry, Wake. Well, they would get, well, they would get the entire ACC because they just want all the Power 5 teams in. And again, you only need a majority of teams to vote to kill the ACC. Dave, what team in the ACC wouldn't agree to be in the Super League? Well, none. I mean, if like if you're Wake or you're Vanderbilt, you're concerned about the Super League because you could drop to relegation, 
right? Right. I mean, that can, I mean, the, you you're not crazy about this, but what choice do you have? Do you, are you going to stand on the front of the Parthenon in downtown Nashville and say, <laughs> "By golly, I'm in, I'm Vanderbilt, so you can take that and stick it," because well, we're what- not going to do this relegation thing, nor a super conference because of Vanderbilt. Boom. What they're going to fight for is they're going to fight for the 70 teams. They're, remember, there's 80 teams, one relegation division, one 10 team relegation division, the theoretical proposal. What Vanderbilt's and Wakes are going to fight for is that they are locked into one of the seven divisions and they never run the risk of being in a relegation division. Now, I don't think that should be the case. And you don't think that should be the case. I think what they should do is like, you know, the best team of the relegation divisions should move into one of the permanent conferences. And the it, one of the permanent divisions that makes the most sense for them, and then the worst team in that certain division, tough break for that team that sucked there. You lose, you're out. I mean, I think that's how they should do it. But Caleb, you know. you're, I mean, you're taking these teams, and once you throw them out and you relegate them, they're never coming back. Oh, they're never coming back. They are. I mean, never they're never going to get the type of money to be able to bounce back. You might as well just shoot them. I mean, I don't understand <laughs> why. I mean, seriously, why? Why are you giving them any mercy whatsoever? Just get out. I mean, just, you know, like the Purge movie, just go around and take out your Vanderbilts and your Wakes and all those schools, and it's one good purge for Calhoun. But, Dave, Vanderbilt-Wake Forest is just a great rivalry in football. Have you ever watched those games? I'm, you'll, you'll win me over with your relegation if it means specifically getting rid of those teams. There are some teams that it would be a shame if they were kind of caught up in the middle, right? Well, I think I, you would have to be. I could see a Mississippi State getting caught up in the middle if they try to pare it down at all. And I like the old Miss Mississippi State game. So I guess there are some teams out there. I would hate to lose a Northwestern, who I think is a borderline Vanderbilt, but a borderline decent football program. I like to see them struggle with smart players. There's some programs I would hate to lose that I would think would be at least close to the chopping block. Well, the I think what would happen is this. So the relegation for the relegation division, that's year to year. Maybe they'll do something like you have to be at the bottom of your conference for three years. And then another team has to be like at the top of the relegation division for three years before they can move into like one of the permanent ones. Is that when they, they got to do some compromise like that, right? I like, have an idea. How about three reckless driving citations you get relegated for a season? Three. So Georgia, Georgia's already yes. relegated. Georgia, you are relegated based off off field behavior. You have been relegated. Behavior. Could you imagine how that would work? Could you That's, imagine if like? Can we just can we just do that tomorrow? Can we just put that in your back pocket, make a little note, and we'll hold that. Should one. all field should all field issues be part of the relegation model? Oh my gosh! Okay, yeah, love it. I let's love get back it. To this real quick. Yes, so, I love it. He's Caleb Calhoun. Sometimes the show just spilled, spills over in tomorrow, into tomorrow. By the way, baseball does start their series with Auburn. You can check out a column that on that by Stacey Oliver on offthehooksports.com. We're, we're on top of it for you. We got you taken care of. So, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, why not that delegation thing? My, my big argument is if you're going to start paying players directly, and I believe that's going to happen, then you absolutely cannot cheat. If you get caught cheating at that point, it needs to be the absolute death penalty. If you're allocated to give Bob Jones, your quarterback, $50,000 a year, and you give him $50,000.50, hammer him, because you have to have some sort of rule. Agree? Disagree, Caleb? Oh, I agree, and I'm even bigger on this, though. You're talking me more into relegating the Vanderbilts and Wake Forest because if you're going to pay all the players evenly and you're going to distribute all this revenue evenly, how unfair is it for a Vanderbilt or Wake Forest to put no effort in investing into their football programs at all and walk away with those checks? And, you know, Nico Iamaliyama. Yeah, this would even be a more extreme case of it. And, you know, Nico Iamaliyama would have to split his revenue with the backup offensive tackle at Vanderbilt in this way. And I'm like, God, like that. I don't know. I just feel like it's not like the NFL where even the worst team with the worst owner still draws fans to their games. So I, I just, 
you're right. They there's more to work out here, but the long story short is if this put it this way, here's the simple takeaway for this. The only way that Florida State and Clemson are getting out of that ACC is if this Super League happens. If this Super League doesn't happen, they're stuck in that conference till 2036. It's forever. He's Caleb Calhoun. I'm Dave Hooker. This has been a presentation of Off the Hook Sports.